from Hollywood writers and actors and UPS drivers to teachers, nurses, and Starbucks baristas, workers and labor unions have had a busy year fighting for higher pay and better working conditions. How have their efforts been panning out for companies and their employees? To discuss, I'm joined by Claire Hammonds, professor of practice at Labor Center at UMass Amherst, and Roy Bahat, head of Bloomberg Beta, an early stage venture capital firm. Claire, how do you assess our summer of labor tumult? Um, well, I think I'd look at a couple of things. I think, you know, for one, we've been seeing more labor activity than we have in many years. And this doesn't just start this summer, right? Even if we look between, you know, 2021 and 2022, we were starting to see these big increases. This past summer, though, I think, as you, you know, your intro mentioned with the writer strike, the actor strike, um, and a couple of big victories from uh, UPS and also American Airlines, we're really starting to see some of those um, some of those organizing efforts and some of those strike preparation efforts really translate into to on the ground gains um, for workers in their contracts. And I think you know what we will wait to see is what happens um, with the big three automakers as they're uh, gearing up for a possible strike that would start next week. Roy, are you seeing um, changes in corporate behavior that are being driven by this increased labor pressure? Um, mm -hmm. I think corporations are just starting to wake up to this. I think for decades, business leaders in the U.S. have mostly been able to ignore organized labor because the percentage of people in the private sector who were unionized was so low, below 10 percent, that, you know, a lot of business leaders would tell me that it was kind of like the library. You know, they knew it was important a long time ago. If maybe they respected it. Maybe they didn't care, but they didn't think about it very much. And then with this renewed attention on organizing, not just unionization, but also all kinds of forms of employee organizing. I mean, people passing around spreadsheets, sharing each other's salaries or petitions calling on their company to be more active on a social issue like climate change. There's now a whole toolkit of how to relate to your workforce that business leaders haven't practiced in a long time, and it's time for them to practice it. So how much of this is just a product of, of historically tight labor markets? I personally think very little. Um, I'd be curious what Claire thinks. I mean, we lead this group at the Aspen Institute um, that's called the Business Aspen Business Roundtable on Organized Labor, which is a, a group of business leaders trying to re-examine their relationship with organized labor. And many of them are in industries where the labor market isn't particularly tight. Of course, in segments where it is tight, that can change the conditions. And like many forms of, um, of intense social action, they often happen not when things are getting worse, but when things have been bad for a long time and then they get better and people have a little bit of hope. And so the hot labor market did give some working people a sense that they had leverage. Claire? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, the, the tight labor market coming out of the pandemic certainly had an impact on this. But I think it's also, you know, it's important to remember that um, there is often a contagion effect with these sorts of things, which is to say that, you know, a lot of the workers we're seeing organized now. Um, I live out in Western Mass in Amherst, right? And we have a, a little strip where we're seeing Barnes and Noble workers organize, Michaels, Trader Joe's, all within sort of a one block period. And a lot of the issues that they're raising with their work about low pay, about scheduling issues, none of those issues are, are new. And but we, what we do see is new is that um, workers perspectives on what's possible and what's possible when they organize and the fact that they can win, um, that is a shift. And so this is to say, you know, I think, um, you know, the tight labor market is is a part of that story. But I think once that sort of gets going, um, workers look around and they see the other folks next to them starting to to win contracts um, and that and that spurs on additional organizing efforts. So, Claire, I mean, I, that, that contagion point, I think, is so important. Just a show like this one, you know, propagates the idea. And if you look at who's organizing, it doesn't feel like traditional organizing. I mean, you look at a guy like Chris Smalls, who led um, the Amazon labor union. You know, he's a celebrity. He looks like a celebrity and acts like one. And that creates inspiration for people. I mean, you can find accounts on Twitter that have fashionable union leaders. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that does inspire folks. Plus, 
new folks entering the working class. I mean, the, you know, the folks who organized at Starbucks just don't look like the people who were striking at an auto factory. They're a different kind of a professional and personal background. And so when people encounter conditions, even if the conditions have existed for a long time, but they see them in a new, fresh way, they get spurred into action. So we've seen upsurges in union membership, but as a fraction of the private sector labor force, union membership has not gone up very much. Is that going to take structural change, or are we going to see unions sort of learn, adapt these new tactics and learn how to recruit members just as effectively as they're learning how to strike better? Claire? Um well, I don't think it's a matter of just like unions going out and recruiting, right? A lot of this is is workers themselves starting to come together. Um, and I think that we will continue to see that increase. Um, and I think, you know, we're also seeing some um, some policy changes that are able to support that. There have been a couple of recent decisions from the National Labor Relations Board um, that have been very favorable towards unionization and I think will open the door um, in the future to to really um, to allow unions to win elections um, and to close some of those loopholes that for a long time have made it possible for employers to act illegally with impunity. Yeah, and personally, I think it's too early to tell. We don't know if how much this will change. I think that what's clear is that whether or not the union membership changes, the percentage of the population, the way that CEOs lead is going to have to change. And we've you know written a magazine article in Harvard Business Review, uh, which is the first time they've had a magazine article about organized labor in 32 years, um, and it's in the most recent issue. And what we say is that CEOs often have to lead as if their workforce is organized, whether or not it is, because that is what workers are starting to demand. And for years, companies have said to workers, you know, we want you to feel like this company reflects your values. We want it to be more than just a job. And on some level, workers are just taking them at their word and saying, okay, if that's what you want, then this is what I want to see. Um, and, uh, and so we, I really think that that leadership skill, and I teach at Berkeley's business school, the most important under-practiced leadership skill for business leaders of the next 20 years might be how to lead an organized workforce. So, Roy, you're making me feel guilty. I, I, I published enough of HBR that I should have done something earlier. Um, but, but I, I want to push on that, right? So why has it been so hard for so many business leaders to acknowledge that, well, I probably all the stuff that I've been saying about leadership, about leadership and values and my workers being part of this, it would, you know, people were actually going to listen to me and take it seriously. I mean, I think that business leaders, their role models were mostly monarchs. You know, the people who lead public companies with two class shares and that kind of thing, uh, you know, end up having a, uh, a, uh, a, a sense of inflated power. And so sharing power is just not the kind of thing that comes naturally to them. That's a new skill. So, Claire, what advice would you give to a business leader who's trying to lead successfully in this new environment? Uh, well, I, I suppose I would say that they should be aware of what the laws are around workers' rights to unionize. Um, and I, you know, I think a big part of the story of why unions have declined um, so much over the last, you know, since the 1970s um, has been about um, corporations getting very good at both um, stopping unionization efforts um, and breaking unions in, in many contexts. And I would certainly say that for employers going forward, that being aware of what those rules are um, and the fact that that workers do have a protected right to organize in the U.S. Um, and that if that's what workers decide to do, that that's their right to do so. so. So, Claire, let me push on that a bit, because they need to follow the law is a very low bar, right? So Yet most don't meet it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. right? Um, the, yeah. the, United States has, the United States had a uniquely violent labor movement and probably has the most antagonistic labor management relations of any industrialized country. So if you were to, for, uh, for both of you, if you were to sort of counsel a business leader and say, maybe that's not the most fruitful way to go forward, what would you tell them to do? I think it's like any other business relationship, which is if you have a counterparty that's powerful, you have to treat them with respect and try to build a relationship. And it is a two-way street. I mean, you know, I've seen cases, I think it, in a fight, it only takes one side to think it's an antagonistic war 
to have an antagonistic war. And so that the, the, the tragedy is that can start on either side of the table. And, you know, unions, for understandable reasons, often start an organizing campaign with personal attacks against the CEO. Um, and so that then makes it really hard for that person to enter into a collaborative mindset. So it's a two-way street, but on the business side, you're right that following the law is a low bar. And at the same time, my guess is you've probably jaywalked in the past year because the penalties are not that steep. And you know the National Labor Relations Board, which Claire just mentioned, has one-tenth the budget roughly of the district attorney of the city of Los Angeles, meaning this is a wildly underfunded agency to enforce the laws and the penalties can be fairly modest. And so they have to do it because it's in their self-interest and their long-term self-interest and just innovate and experiment on how to have a healthier relationship. That's basically what we counsel them to do. I, I, I live in Boston. I believe it's actually against the law to not jaywalk here. But I, 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 so Claire, just to end with you, if, if what is the next phase of this labor movement activism that we're seeing? What do you think is going to happen that's going to change the way we think about labor in the next year as, as so much has happened in the last year? Um, well, I guess I would say the next, I don't know if I want to say phase, um, but I think as the as the strength and power of organized labor grows and, and if it continues to grow in that way, um, you know, I think having a, a meaningful sharing of, of power within businesses that allows workers, um, the people who, who do the work um, and who often know it the best, um, to be part of those decisions about how businesses proceed and to really see a, a, a more equal power sharing between employers and workers um, would really be the next sort of step there. Claire, Roy, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you.